We are continuing our series in the Acts of the Apostles, and we have put a subtitle under that for a reason, because it's, it's not just a collection of stories, it's not just a history book about how the church began and how the gospel of Jesus Christ spread throughout the known world in the first century. It is that, but it's more than that. The book of Acts really is a call to action to believers and to churches like ours today. And I'm so glad that you're here uh, to be part of it uh, throughout this series. I, I was at the gym recently, and I was just finishing up my workout. And as I was sitting, uh, we, we, do, uh, we do our abs, you know, at this stuff here. We do this stuff at the end. And I'm sitting on the mat and getting ready to leave. And in walks this guy, and he starts his workout. He was huge. This guy not only was tall, he was at least 6'5", maybe taller, and he was just jacked. His muscles had muscles, and uh, as I'm, I'm watching him, he's like throwing weight around just like it was nothing. He looked like a monster, and so I, I observed this as I'm finishing my workout, and it felt to me in that moment like, what am I doing here? I am wasting my time. I will never look like that guy, right? And so I got up and I went to the desk and I canceled my members. No, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do that. But there's that moment uh, that I experienced uh, recently where I thought, you know, as, I, as I was comparing myself to somebody else, and some of that is just God-given genetics, right? I mean, you are as tall as you are. You can't stretch yourself, right? You are just a, there's a bone makeup that people have. And so I was comparing myself to somebody else, and it, it, it caused me to think, why am I doing this? Is it, even, is it even worth it? But then quickly, I was reminded, I had to remind myself why I was there in the first place. The reason I work out is to stay healthy. The reason that I work out uh, is to deal with stress in my life. The reason I work out at, uh, at a local gym instead of at my house is so that I can make connections with people in the community. All of these are good reasons to go and, and, and get a good workout in. It has nothing to do with comparing myself or being in a competition with somebody else. And comparison has its place in life. Comparison, I think, is something that's fine when it comes to competition. If, you, if you're going to have a competition, you buy by definition, have to have comparison. If we had an apple pie contest, you would have to, and I would be happy to do this if we want to set it up, we, we would have to have a comparison between the apple pies in that competition. So there's a place for comparison. There's a place in life for healthy competition. But not everything in life is a competition. Not everything in life is supposed to be a competition. I think for some people, for Christians, I think there are times when the Christian life can become frustrating. I think sometimes the Christian life can even become demoralizing for some because here's what happens. Sometimes Christians will compare themselves to other Christians who may have a different spiritual gift than they do. And maybe that spiritual gift that God has blessed someone else with, maybe it gets more attention. Maybe uh, it's more visible than the spiritual gift that God has blessed this person with. Or maybe there's a ministry that God has blessed with greater impact over here in this ministry than He does in this ministry. And God has reasons for that. But maybe this person who's involved in this ministry looks over there and sees a ministry of greater impact and, and feels this comparison or this competition between the two. And it can become frustrating. It can become demoralizing when we do that. When comparison turns into this unhealthy competition, it's not good for us. And it's not that uh, the competition in and of itself is wrong. Like I said, there's a place for that in life. And even there's a, there's a healthy way that Paul described competition when it comes to our Christian life. He described the Christian life as like running a race. We all run the race, so you might as well. In fact, he said you really should run the Christian race like you want to win it. Run the Christian race like you really want to give God your best, that you're not giving God a half effort. 
So there's a healthy uh, idea of competition when it comes to our faith, but boy, when, when Christians allow comparison to turn their Christian life into, into a competition with other Christians, that's not healthy. It's not good. God's not called us to compete with other Christians or with other churches. There's not going to be uh, this best Christian award handed out. There's, there shouldn't be. Comparing ourselves with those who God has gifted with maybe more intelligence. There's people who are smarter than you. There's people who are on the planet way smarter than me. And that's okay. There are people who have much more musical talent than I do. I can barely keep a rhythm. And that's okay. There are people who have more money than I do. People that may have more money than you do. There are are people that God has blessed with greater leadership skills, perhaps. God's not called us to be in competition with each other. He has called us simply to live a Jesus-centered life. And we're to use whatever gifts, to use whatever resources that God has blessed us with, blessed you with, blessed me with, to whatever, uh, whatever amount of those gifts or resources, whatever impact, to whatever measure God has blessed us with. We're just to use that to serve God and to serve others. That's it. And this morning, we're going to read a story from the book of Acts about a couple people who lost sight of that. And because they lost sight of that, boy, life got sideways real quick for them. Would you join me in Acts chapter 5? If you've been reading ahead a little bit, you know where we're, where we're uh, landing today. In Acts chapter 5, we're talking about Ananias and Sapphira. Some of you know that story. And while you're turning to Acts 5, let me read to you the end of chapter 4. Because the end of chapter 4 kind of sets the stage, puts us into the context of what we're about to read in chapter 5. All right? So I'm going to read this to you from chapter 4, verse 32. This was the, the condition of the early church. This describes... Uh, the attributes of the early church at this particular moment, this particular season of the church's history. Verse 32, all the believers were united in heart and mind. There was unity around Jesus, and it made a huge impact, not only in, in this local church in Jerusalem, but it was making an impact in the community. They felt that... Uh, they, They felt that what they owned was not their own, and so they shared everything that they had. There was this incredible generosity happening. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. There was incredible preaching happening. And God's great blessing was upon them all. God was doing amazing, incredible things on them individually and on them as a church. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses, they'd sell them, bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, an example of this, there was a man named Joseph. He was the one that the apostles nicknamed Barnabas. Barnabas is a name that means son of encouragement. That was his nickname. He was from the tribe of Levi. He came from the island of Cyprus. And Barnabas sold a field that he owned. He brought the money to the apostles. Just an example, a real-life example of what was being described and what was happening in this local church. So we take that context. We take that, uh, those attributes of what was happening at that time into this story of chapter 5. The church is growing rapidly. The church is healthy. All the believers, it says, are one in one heart, one mind. They're unified around living a Jesus-centered life. Now, I do think we need to pause here for a moment and just clarify something. It'll it'll matter as we walk through what we're talking about in in chapter 5. Some have gone to this passage here in chapter 4, the end of chapter 4, and they've attempted to use what we see here, use this description of the early church, 
as a way to promote a government system of communism, a government system of socialism. But this is not a government system that's being described here. This was just Jesus-centered living. This, what we see here, is a voluntary generosity motivated by love. That's not what communism is. That's not what socialism is. Those are government systems that, that force control of resources. That's not what this is. This is a voluntary generosity that is motivated by love. We'll come back to that a little bit later. And one of the examples of this generosity, this extreme generosity that's motivated by love, is this man named Barnabas. I, I just love his name. Can you imagine if, uh, how awesome that would be to have your nickname be son of encouragement, daughter of encouragement? Like, that's what people think about you. It's not an ironic nickname. You know, it's like calling that muscle-bound guy at the gym chubby. Don't do that, first of all. I would not recommend doing that. But that's not what this is. This is not an ironic nickname. He earned that nickname. When you read about uh, Barnabas throughout the book of Acts, you see this guy was just wired by God to be an encourager. Anyway, Barnabas felt led by the Holy Spirit to sell a field that he owned and give the money to the church so that they could help those in need. So the scene is incredible. This spirit-filled church that God is growing. More sinners are coming to a saving faith in Jesus Christ and miracles are being done and there's powerful preaching, there's powerful worship, extreme generosity, this unbreakable unity around Jesus. There's, they've got a positive reputation in the community what could possibly go wrong? What could possibly stop the powerful impact of this church? Enter chapter 5. Verse 1 says, starts with the word but. Now, here's how the language works. When you have the word but, if what comes before that is negative, well, you want to see the word but. Like, this was terrible, this was awful, this was, uh, this was the worst, but... Because what that means what's coming next is good and positive and wonderful. If what you just read was positive, wonderful, and incredible, and then you see the word but, we're going left turn in the wrong direction. And that's what we're about to see. But there was a certain man named Ananias who, with his wife Sapphira, sold some property. So they did it too. Barnabas did it. and Now they did it. Ananias brought part of the money to the apostles. That's good. That's nice. That's good generosity. But here's the problem. He claimed it was the full amount. Now, we're not told what the amounts are. But whatever he sold the, uh, the property for, he claimed that he had given it all. Now, why would he do that? Well, that, that looks good. I, I sold the property for whatever amount of money, and, and here's all. Use it all. Use it all for people's needs. He lied. And his wife knew about it. His wife was part of it. His wife consented, it says, and he kept the rest. Well, it appears that the Holy Spirit tells Peter or somehow lets Peter know that this happened because Peter confronts him. Peter says this to him in verse 3. Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit. You, you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or to not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away, keep, invest, whatever you wanted to do with it. It's your money. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us. You lied to God. You lied to the Holy Spirit. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Oh boy. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Yeah, I guess so. Then some young men got up. They, they wrapped him in a sheet. They, they took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife, Sapphira, came in. And she didn't know what had happened. Which is curious how that's possible, but... Uh, 
she didn't. She didn't know what was happening. And, and Peter asked her, what was the price that you and your husband received for your land? Now, you know this in reality. If someone asks you that, they're asking for a reason, right? That's not just a casual question. So anyone who has any kind of relational uh, or, or common sense type of skill set in life would pick up on, hmm, especially if you knew you did something wrong, right? Why are you asking me that? So She doubled down. She had an opportunity to repent, to tell the truth, and say, you know what, Peter, I, we lied. Uh, I, I, we were wrong. She could have done that. She doubled down. Yes, she replied, that's the price. That was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door, and they will carry you out too. And instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. Yeah, I would imagine so. Now, I don't know if you've read that story or not before. Some of you, you've read that a number of times, and some of you may that the first time. But you may, you may read that and think, that seems like an overreaction by God. And if that's how you're reading it, if that's how you are interpreting that story, I want to remind you of a couple things. Number one, I think it's important to remember that it is only by God's grace that we aren't all evaporated by God because of our sin. That's what we deserve. Uh, Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin, the payment deserved by sin or for sin is what? It's death. That's what we deserve. Romans 9 was a passage I remember studying like in depth for the first time back in seminary. And it just, it, it completely changed a lot of things that I understood or, or thought that I understood about the sovereignty of God. So if you've ever struggled with just uh, really grasping the sovereignty of God in, in the sense that there are days when you think uh, that, that God owes you something or that you think uh, that God should do what you want Him to do because of X, Y, or Z. Like if you ever found yourself at odds thinking about God, like I don't get why you're doing this, you should... You know, I, I do this, this, and this for you, therefore you should, you should bless me with it. Like if you ever struggle with, I don't, I don't like the, that God's not doing what I want, spend some time in Romans chapter 9. Because Romans chapter 9 reminds us very vividly that God doesn't owe you or me anything. God would be perfectly justified in pouring out the full measure of His wrath on us because of our sin. Perfectly justified, if He chose to do that. But He doesn't. Because of God's grace and mercy, God instead sent His Son, Jesus, as a sacrificial payment for our sin. Jesus took the punishment that our sin deserves. It is only by faith in God's gift of grace that was paid for by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross through the power of His resurrection. It's only through faith in Christ alone that we are made right with God. And we have to remember that. We, 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 don't, we, don't, deserve, we don't deserve anything other than separation from God for all of eternity, but because of God's love and grace, He made a way for us to be made right with Him, to, to experience eternal life. So we have to remember that. God doesn't owe us anything. I think it's also important to remember just the context of the, the time period of the early church. And when this was happening, the church was just getting started. This was something new. And so all eyes were on it, and, and you have all of these miracles that were happening that were validating what the apostles were teaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And I want you to imagine this, uh, this new thing, this, this, new, this, this new thing called the church. And as it's getting started, you've got this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, who do something generous, do something good, and nobody knows about it but them and God, as far as they lied. Their integrity wasn't there when they did it. They deceived people. We know from the book of Acts, uh, Barnabas is mentioned there, and, and be, because of who he was, he was an encourager, but certainly someone that people looked up to. He rose to a position of leadership. Later on, we're going to see in chapter 6, there was a group of people, one of which was Stephen. And because of, because of people uh, looking to him as seeing him as someone who loves Jesus and, and uh, that they believe to be trustworthy and, and honorable, he rose to a position of of leadership. This is kind of how things normally go. And so imagine Ananias and Sapphira, if, if, if they get away with the deception and everyone has a favorable view of them in the church and they rise to a place of leadership or influence within the church, but their integrity isn't there, it's only a matter of time until they do something again that's going to damage not only the church internally, but their reputation of the church outside as well. And we have to understand that God is protecting the early church at this time. It's not an overreaction. God never overreacts. In fact, I think if we were to be truly honest with the situation, we, we would have to walk away saying, actually, God is way more patient and gracious with us than we deserve. The other pause that I would want to put and just talk about for just a moment when we read this story is just a caution to those who might look at our modern experience of the church and say something like, you know, a spirit-filled church, which I think we would want. We want our church to be filled with God's spirit. We want people uh, here to be filled with the spirit of God. But there are some who might say a spirit-filled church should be seeing miraculous healings on a regular basis, like uh, here in the book of Acts. And if you're not, well, they must not be a spirit-filled church. As if our church experience today needs to or should look exactly like the church experience that the apostles were experiencing in the first century, to which I would ask this. Do you also think that God should strike down any Christian who sins. Just drop them dead, like right where they stand, like in the early church. Do you also think that? Probably not. Public miracles have always had a, a place in validating God's message, in validating God's messenger. You, you can look all the way back to the time of the Exodus, and Moses comes in, and there's these miracles in it that uh, God performs through him, and they validate him as a messenger. They validate his message as uh, God is bringing the slaves, the Hebrew slaves, out of Egypt. And you fast forward throughout Scripture to the, the public ministry of Jesus and his miracles and the apostles in the New Testament. God had a purpose for those public miracles to validate the message of the kingdom of God, to validate the gospel. But you also see instances throughout Scripture where there are private miracles. There, Jesus also did private miracles, and he, and, he, and he did those miracles out of love, out of compassion, and, and he even told people, don't, don't tell anybody about this. No, they did, but that wasn't the purpose of some of those miracles. Sometimes Jesus just healed people because of love and compassion and their faith in him. And so, yes, we should still have faith in God today to do miracles in our lives. And we should absolutely pray for God to intervene in our lives on our behalf. But not everything about the Spirit-filled church in Acts will be exactly like the Spirit-filled church that you and I experience today. And that's okay. You know, for one, we don't have apostles. That's one difference. You're stuck with me, right? But we do have the testimony of the Word of God, which is amazing. God may not still 
be doing as many miracles to validate his message in the same way. And I, I think that still happens. There are places in the world you hear stories from missionaries. I think if God wants to do a miracle to validate his message or his messenger, God will do that, right? He's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. So it may not be happening in the exact same way that it did in the book of Acts uh, or, or as much as it, as it did then, but it doesn't mean that we can't be a spirit-filled church. Filled with spirit-filled Christians where God is using you, where He's using me, where He's using us as a church to make an incredible impact in the world around us. And I want to talk about what that looks like this morning as we talk about a spirit-filled church and what it looks like to follow Jesus and to live a Jesus-centered life. But I think let's just take a, one more minute and go back to this story and let's think about how this happened. How is, how, how is it possible that this tragedy happened in the first place? Is, is it possible that Ananias and Sapphira were just these evil hucksters pretending to be Christians with some maniacal plan to destroy the church from within, to sabotage it from within? Well, based on what Luke wrote... And that's what we have to go by. It doesn't appear to be a plan of sabotage. Peter said that they lied to the Holy Spirit, which implies that they had the Holy Spirit. And how do you get the Holy Spirit? Well, you only have the Holy Spirit through, through God's grace, through faith in Jesus, and, and, and in salvation, we're given the Holy Spirit. So it, it seems as though what, uh, what Peter is saying is that they, they in fact, had the Holy Spirit, and, and certainly based on the way the story is written, uh, it, it appears as though they were just trying to, to compete with Barnabas in, in getting some praise and some uh, type of uh, affirmation from other people within the church. It doesn't look as though they were trying to sabotage it or destroy it. I think it's more likely as you read the story that you know, when Peter says, why did you let Satan fill your heart? It appears to me as though Satan was using comparison with Barnabas to fuel within them jealousy, to fuel a desire for praise and affirmation from others. They saw themselves in competition with Barnabas for what? The award of most generous? They didn't have to sell their property. No one forced them to do that. That's not what, this isn't communism. They weren't forced to do that. They weren't forced to uh, give any of it, even if they chose to sell their property. They, they could keep all the money for themselves, or they, you know, if they wanted, they could have given 10%. They weren't forced to do any of these things. They didn't even have to disclose how much they kept for themselves or how much they gave to the church. All of that should have been between them and the Lord. As the Holy Spirit directed their hearts, prompted their hearts, led their hearts to give in whatever amount the Holy Spirit told them to give it. But instead, they compared themselves with Barnabas and they allowed generosity to turn into this competition. But God has not called us to compete with other Christians for the best Christian award or compare ourselves to others whom God has gifted, maybe with more intelligence or, or maybe with more musical talent or maybe people who are more or able to be more generous with their money. When that happens, it just turns into this weird type of competition with others for praise, praise that only God deserves. I could give you a very long list of things that God has gifted others in greater measure than me. I am fully aware of, of the things that are on that list. But that doesn't mean that, that I should give up. It doesn't mean that you should be discouraged because God has gifted someone else with something that He didn't gift you with or, or me with or in the measure that He gifted them with it. Any more than I should stop going to the gym just because there are guys there who are bigger and stronger and younger than I am. If comparison and competition become our focus, 
then we've forgotten why we're even doing what we're doing in the first place. We, we, we have forgotten our calling. God has simply called us to live a Jesus-centered life, to use whatever gift He's given you in whatever measure He has given it to you, to use whatever resources He has given to me or to you in whatever measure He has blessed us with, to simply use those things for His glory, for His honor, to serve Him and to serve others with gladness and joy in our hearts. I want to think about how this true story from from history speaks into our call to action today. What does it actually look like to live a Jesus-centered life? We say it a lot, and and hopefully throughout the year we we fill in uh, a little bit more understanding uh, into what we mean by that. We want to have a spirit-filled church filled with spirit-filled people that are living a Jesus-centered life. Well, what does that what does that look like? We go back to uh, chapter four and at the end of, of chapter four. We we see some we see some things that uh, that defined this early church. Number one, they were extremely generous, weren't they? I mean, you saw that in chapter two. You see it uh, here here again in chapter four. They were extremely generous. And it wasn't out of guilt. They didn't have to have a capital campaign and, and guilt people in, into giving more. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't out of uh, forced government taxation or something like that. They didn't do it, at least others other than you know, Ananias and Sapphira. Most, most people weren't giving just so they could look good or so they could impress other people. No, they were motivated by love. They were, and that love was generated by God's grace in their lives. And we can experience that. That's absolutely something we can experience. When we give, no one, no one needs to know about it. When we're ext- extreme in generosity, we don't, we don't need to ha- be applauded. We don't need to have our name attached to a plaque in celebration of our generosity. If we're doing it for the right reasons, we don't need any of that stuff. When we put Jesus in the center of our lives, His Spirit is going to motivate us through love to just want to be extremely generous. And we can experience that. There's no reason that we can't. They were extremely generous. We also see in the early church, they they were extremely unified around Jesus. You can see that phrase in uh, in chapter 4, all the believers were united in heart and mind. And I want you to just think about the reality of what that meant and what it can mean for us. This was a church that went from what, like 120 people to thousands very rapidly. And it wasn't like they were all the same um, in, in, in everything in life. You had rich and poor. That's the first thing we notice. Obviously, you had to have very wealthy people who owned more than one home or who owned multiple plots of land. That meant they were wealthy to the point where they were able to sell some or one of those pieces of property uh, in order to help those who were what? Poor. So you had wealthy people, you had poor people in the same church. And those are two different cultures, you understand? Those who have a lot of money see the world just differently. They have different questions that they ask about life and, and, and different tensions that they deal with in life than those who don't have a lot of money. It's just a different set of circumstances uh, that, that they don't experience life in the same way. And you put them together, they're different. It's not that one is better than the other. They're just, it's a difference between the two that doesn't match up as far as you know, how you would normally hang out with this person or that person. They had different ethnic backgrounds. Remember, from Pentecost, they have these different languages that uh, through, the, through the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit, as the apostles were, were preaching the gospel, people of different native tongue or first languages were able to hear and understand them, which means you've got different ethnic backgrounds all coming together into one church. Well, you have different ethnic backgrounds, you have different value systems, you have different worldviews, you have all these different things, all these different people coming together that shouldn't, on paper, get along. On paper, these people would not normally be friends. 
But because of their incredible love for Jesus, they had incredible love for each other. And we can experience that. We absolutely can experience that today. My wife and I had the opportunity to go to, a, so it wasn't really a funeral, more of a, a celebration of life for a friend of ours recently in, uh, in Johnstown. My, this is 30 years ago. 30 years ago, my, my dad was a pastor in Johnstown, downtown Johnstown. If you know anything about Johnstown, it was in Kernville. And, uh, you know, Kernville, Moxham, there's some of these uh, communities that are they're rough. They're inner city culture. And uh, so we went to this celebration of life, and we haven't seen some of these people in 25 years. But while we were there, we had, we had nothing in common. Not nothing. We had very little in common because we're all from this rural community over here. And I'm telling you, when I say inner city, I mean, it's all in inner city. And uh, just one quick example, my sister reminded me of this. Uh, one of the kids in our youth group, uh, we had uh, brought them over here into the cove for something, and uh, they were in Martinsburg, walking down the street in Martinsburg, and I guess someone waved. You know, people do that, right? In Johnstown, uh, he thought someone wanted to fight. Let's go, right now, we're going to fight. And I'm like, no, dude, they, they're just saying hi, right? So it's just a different way of seeing the world. And uh, so different cultures, and on paper, these, these, these folks wouldn't be people that I would normally possibly be friends with, let alone become family. And that's what they became. They became family. Here we are 30 years later, and seeing some of these people uh, at this celebration for life, uh, it was just like family getting back together. There's just a love that has been unbroken over 30 years. And on paper, that makes no sense. But because of our love for Jesus, we are connected and, and, and there is this unity of relationship that takes place. And we can experience that here as well. We can show the world what it looks like when, when the color of our skin doesn't matter, when, when economic status doesn't matter. When, when levels of intelligence or levels of athleticism or some people have more of the cool factor than other people, right? That's just the reality in life. And it doesn't matter when we're unified around Jesus. None of it will hinder our relationships when we're all in love with Jesus. That's what connects us. We can have extreme unity in our church and our relationships. We all love Jesus. The other thing I see is they were extremely willing to serve. Well, we didn't look at this chapter. We might touch on it later, but in chapter 6, because of the fast growth that they were experiencing, which is exciting, but like any, any ministry that grows, there are ministries that uh, will have tension in them because of growth. Those are good problems to have. Those are the kind of problems if we had a choice, we would rather choose those kind of problems. But one of the ministries in that church was a ministry for widows who had no income, and they would help them. They would help them with food or whatever they would need. And uh, that particular ministry was experiencing a tension. It was experiencing a problem because you had two different ethnic groups in the same church, and one of them felt like the other ethnic group was overlooking their widows. You had the, the Grecian Jews who did not speak Hebrew, and that for the most part, they didn't have a lot of problems. They were, they were more comfortable with Greek culture than the Hebraic Jews who could speak Hebrew and uh, were pretty, pretty strict when it came to separating themselves from Greek culture. So you have these two ethnic backgrounds, and the Grecian Jews felt like the Hebraic Jews were overlooking their widows in this ministry, and it caused a tension in their relationship. But that, that strength of unity, when you read through that story, you find out not only did it hold, but it also revealed, I think, an extreme willingness for people, God's people, to just step up and serve, to serve God and to serve others. Here's how they resolved it. They resolved that issue by having seven Grecian Jews oversee that ministry. Not three and four, not four and three. Fine. You take the whole ministry you're passionate about it, it matters to you, find seven guys to lead it, you take the ministry. We trust you. You'll do a good job. 
Not only does that, I think, show this incredible wisdom in handling a sensitive situation, an ethnic issue, but quite honestly, I love it because it it put pressure on those who had the problem to be part of the solution. And I think we can experience that today. Our, Our church continues, by God's grace, to be blessed you know, with growth, and that's wonderful, and, and we pray that God continues to do that. But as we grow, so do the ministry needs. And I just love it. We just recently experienced this here. We needed more help in the nursery in second service. And uh, so we asked, we asked for help. It was a, f- a few weeks that we had asked for that help, and it took a little bit of time, but people stepped up. People stepped up, and, and, and they're serving God in that ministry. We have nine We have nine babies in the nursery second service you need help right and we had people step up and say i'll help you know, it's one thing that you know anybody it's easy it's easy to sit in a room and complain and grumble these babies blah, 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 blah. you can do that or you can do what our folks did you can step up and be part of the solution and i love that they did that these are all ways that you and i can live jesus-centered lives today It's not by comparing ourselves to others. It's not competing with other people for praise or affirmation. Instead, it's just giving, and it's it's serving out of love and unity around Jesus. If you can show me a church that is filled with people who love Jesus so much that they are extremely generous, that they are willing to serve wherever God needs them to serve to the best of their ability with whatever gifts that God has blessed them with. If you can show me that church, then I can show you a church that is spirit-filled and filled with spirit-filled people. And I want that. I I want that for Grace Fellowship. I, I, I know that Many, if not most of you, want that for Grace Fellowship Church. You want that for your life, your own life. You want that for your family. You want that in your marriage. I love that this story brings this to life. I, I, I think it's also important that this story reminds us how important it is to live a life of integrity and honesty. And I know most of you, you want to be a man and a woman or a student who is trustworthy. You want to be known for being honest. You want to be known for doing the right thing even when the only one who sees, the only one who knows is God. You want that. I want that. That's why it's so important to live a Jesus-centered life. We're not competing against each other. No, we are in the race. We are running together as a team. That's, That's the picture that we should keep in our mind. As we run together as a team, we we cheer each other on. Keep keep running. Keep going. Don't give up. And when someone falls, we we, we pick them up. We we dust them off. Maybe we have to bandage up some scraped knees or whatever, and we got to keep going together. We have to remind each other that the pain that we experience in the race, it will be worth it. When we reach the finish line, we're not there yet. Keep going. It'll be worth it when we get there. That's what we're called to do. Not compare each other, not compete with each other. We're running together. Living Jesus-centered lives. And if we all do that, you do it, I do it. If we all do that, if we're all unified around Jesus, there's no stopping what God wants to do in us and through us as a, as a church, as, as a follower of Jesus Christ. He can't stop us. That's what we want here at Grace Fellowship.